Hi, welcome to the Israel First television program from our studios in Jerusalem. Great to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us today. What an exciting time we're living in, the 50 years of Jerusalem, and we've just had the visit of the Indian Prime Minister, and we're going to briefly be talking about that at the be beginning of the program. We've got a very special guest in the studio, uh, Rabbi Dove Lipman. Thank you so much, Dove, for coming over it's today to and be uh, being with us. Great to have you with us. Um, it's such a such an exciting time for Israel at the moment. There's such a, a momentum and a fi uh, things going on with the Trump coming and the 50 years of Jerusalem. And in the uh, in the Jerusalem Post, we feature news and interviews from Israel, and we've got the Jerusalem Post. And it's got, uh, as well as being very hot here, it's got uh, the visit, first ever visit of the Indian Prime Minister in an unusual move that indicates just how significant uh, Israel is placing on the visit of the Indian Prime Minister. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu cleared most of his schedule for the visit so that he could accompany him throughout the country. Now, this doesn't normally happen, do they? When they have a big, uh, when they have a, a prime minister or somebody coming, he has a, sure he has a few meetings, but he doesn't have the prime minister of Israel doesn't clear his schedule. So this is a, this is for a very important guest. And and uh, Netanyahu said, I will accompany the prime minister. This is the Indian Prime Minister to as many events as possible during his visit. Ordinarily, he only meets the heads of government for one or two meetings. This will be Modi's second visit to Israel, but his first ever as an Indian Prime Minister. So uh, maybe, Dove, we could just uh, talk a bit about that. And then uh, we're going to um, look at all sorts of things. We've got Dove's, uh, 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 Rabbi Dove's books in the uh, studio today. An American member of Knesset behind the scenes in the Knesset. We're going to tell you how you can get hold of that. You're going to have, want that on your bookshelf. And also uh, uh, Dove's book, a, How to uh, the Unifying a Nation, the Vision for the Future of Israel. I'm going to be talking about that as well. So, so just a few thoughts, Dove, on, on, um, on the visit of the Indian Prime Minister. Sure. You know, historically, uh, Israel relied on Europe to be its uh, friends and for democratic alliances. And over the last number of years, uh, Israeli government and Israelis in general uh, have felt we've gotten the cold shoulder from Europe, where there's this anti-Israel bias, which is really not explainable, uh, and uh, UN resolutions against us and UN human rights. I love the Paris. Uh, there was the big... Uh shindig in Paris where they have the meeting. At Correct. They all, they'll get together and they'll tell us how to make peace with our neighbors. And there's been a growing feeling of isolation. By the way, the last number of years was a little bit difficult the United States of America uh, as well. And there's been a recent shift, both in terms of attitude from America, but also Israel finding new allies. That's in the uh, African continent, where African countries are realizing the benefits that can come to them from an alliance with Israel in terms of technology and water and all kinds of other areas, and then going further towards the east, towards countries like India. I mean, this is in a whole new world, uh, which is opening up. And India is an amazing country. It's a massive, a massive because it's got all sorts of issues as well. It's a huge population to feed and. Um, you know, it's the big. I think it's one of the biggest uh, countries p for population, other than maybe China. It's a huge, a huge amount of people, and yet the technological advances, the call centers uh, in India, the the work on computers and software, just like in Israel, is Israel's working on uh, software and uh, absolutely amazing. Absolutely, a huge possibilities, both on a economic level in terms of business uh, sharing and also just on a diplomatic level for Israel to be able to secure friends. Uh, okay, Europe, you don't want to focus on us. You want to be anti-Israel. We'll be fine. Uh, with God's help, we'll find other friends around the world. And that's exactly what's happening, new opportunities. And that's why, for the prime minister, uh, why this is such an important visit, because a leader of such a large country with such a large population, as you said, which doesn't have the opportunities at the moment that Israel can help it with, there could be so much cooperation on so many levels. They were talking about basically every ministry uh, can work together with the, the, their, their uh, counterpart in the Indian government, and that's what we're looking for. Uh, Israel is a country which seeks friends. Uh, we don't seek conflict, and if we can share uh, our know-how uh, with the world and, and help people in the world live in a more comfortable life and make the world a better place, that's what we're going to do. Now, originally, uh, as most people will be able to tell, you're from the United States. You're from uh, from Maryland in, 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 uh, in America. 
And uh, so maybe it'd be very interesting for our viewers to know how you've come. You, you're now living in, uh, in Israel, in, in Beth Shemesh, I understand. And uh, maybe you can tell us how you came from America. And, and of course, uh, which is connected as well with the book, uh, An American Member of Knesset, behind the scenes in the Knesset. And we'll be uh, telling you how you can get hold of that book. So maybe you can tell us how, how did you... You've, you've come from America, from a family in the United States, end up in the Israeli parliament. Yeah, I grew up uh, in a regular American family, a very patriotic American uh, family. The American flag flew outside our home all year round. My father, of blessed memory, was a judge in the U.S. government. Uh, I grew up, uh, I hope I won't hurt anybody's sensitivities, but a Washington Redskins fan, a Baltimore Orioles fan, just a real part of sort of the American life that is so comfortable and so wonderful. And as an Orthodox Jew, very welcoming. I never experienced any anti-Semitism and was able to worship and live a Jewish lifestyle uh, in Maryland. My wife and I were here on a trip in Israel. Uh, I, I was an educator. Uh, I was teaching in a high school in Maryland, and they brought the school on a school trip to Israel. And we were traveling around here, and after a few days, we looked at each other and we said, America's great and it's comfortable, but this is the land that God has promised to us. This is a Jewish homeland, our biblical ancestral homeland. It's a Jewish state. We want to raise our children here. And I began looking into it and was blessed to find jobs in education uh, in Israel. Had no aspirations uh, for politics. If you'd have told me coming off that plane in July 2004 that within about eight years I'd find myself you know, in politics and the Knesset, I would have told you it's not possible. I had no aspirations for it. Hebrew-wise, that would be impossible. Culture-wise. Uh, but in the city of Beit Shemesh, where we live, a wonderful, incredible place. I always tell the story. The first Friday afternoon, I was sitting on our porch with my children, and I opened up the Bible and to the book of Samuel, where it talks about the Ark of the, uh, Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines. They were filled with all kinds of plagues and troubles. They sent it back. And it says, just in black and white in the words, and it arrived back in the field of a man in Beit Shemesh, the city where we live. Wow. And I said to my children, you know, imagine maybe it was coming over that mountain that we see over there. I couldn't do that in Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, so just an incredible place to live. The Bible comes to life. You feel at home. But I learned very quickly that there are challenges in the Jewish state, and uh, especially around that terminology of Jewish state. What does that mean? There are more religious, there are less religious, and issues about religious services, uh, how should marriages be performed in Israel, what should the Sabbath day look like in Israel, all kinds of issues of religion and state, which were foreign to me as an American, uh, because we have separation of church and state. In Israel, we don't. We want to be a Jewish state. And there were tensions between different populations, and I felt like, you know, we focus so much on our security issues, as we should. We're surrounded on all sides by enemies who want to destroy us. But what about who we are from within? You know, if we don't get ourselves from in order from within, we're never going to have peace. And, and there's a, there's, I, I know there's one picture of you where you're confronting some, uh, some people would call them extreme, but they're zealous, I guess, yeah. would be a good way of putting them, fair, to put them fairly. Zealous, uh, orthodox, ultra-orthodox uh, people who live in your neighborhood, you're confronting them and there's, uh, there's things going on. And I understand there was even, they were putting thing, uh, writing things down and displaying things, and uh, so there was a whole battle. Yeah, a lot of it was related to women's dress. They, they right. wanted women to dress more modestly. And, and again, uh, we live in a free country. Women who want to dress more modestly should be able to do so, but no one should be forcing anybody else. And this is part of that tension of the Jewish state. So that's when I got involved in community activism, and that ultimately uh, led me to politics. And so did you, did you join a party straight away, or did you...? So not right away, but then uh, I, I started looking around to see are there any parties that are dealing with these issues. And there was a new party called Yesh Atid, which means there is a future, uh, being started by a guy who was rated as the most popular Israeli before he got involved in politics. Uh, his name is Yair Lapid. And he was talking about a lot of these domestic issues. As a secular Jew living in Israel, he was saying that he wants to work together with the religious and sort of bridge those gaps and find areas of compromise. And that was music to my ears. This is what I believe we need to do. So I joined uh, his party and the government collapsed in Israel. We went to elections and he asked me to be number 17 on the list for Knesset, which was not realistic at all. It was a brand new party, was polling at like five seats at the time. We worked really hard uh, during the elections and an amazing thing happened along the way. With God's help, we won 19 seats. We were the second largest party uh, in the Knesset and overnight, 
I found myself as a relatively new immigrant uh, uh, elected to serve as a member of the Knesset, which was and the that, greatest blessing imaginable. And our viewers can, uh, our friends at home, you can um, find out more and uh, because there's a, bit, a lot more be, uh, to the story in the book, an American uh, member of Knesset behind the scenes in the 19th Knesset. How can they get this book? What's the best way? So uh, it's available on Amazon at American MK. That The whole concept was open up the world of the Israeli parliament to people who are English speakers from around the world. You see behind the scenes stories, you get a sense for what, how it works, you'll get a sense for some of the challenges uh, that we have as well. There's a little bit of my story in there. The way I see it, that book captures the incredible times in which we live, in which uh, we say in Hebrew the prophecy "Veshavu banim ligvulam" that the children come back to their borders. Uh, just a few days ago, we welcomed another group from North America coming and landing with the help of an organization called Nefesh Benefesh. I was there at the airport, where 200 people coming and taking hold of their homeland. You know, for 2,000 years we've been saying next year in Jerusalem, and, and here it is. Uh, it's the most amazing story on, in, I think, in world history. There's no story of a people who were exiled and for 2,000 years held on to a belief that these prophecies will come true. And here it is. So this book very much captures that. Just you get, you see our own self-determination. We have our own parliament. Uh, there are Jewish elements to it, which are incredible. Some of the challenges that we have that we, as a Jewish state that also embraces and welcomes non-Jews as well. Uh, just that concept of, of the incredible times in which we live. And the most meaningful part for me is my grandmother, uh, may she live and be well, who 73 years ago arrived in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Most of her family was slaughtered that night, put in gas chambers. She was spared, and she came and visited me in the Knesset. Wow. And, and, and 70 years later, and she's sitting there, and she says, Dove, this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. It's like, it's like a dream, really. Yeah, a Jewish state, Israel, Jewish capital, Jerusalem, a unified Jerusalem, a Jewish parliament, her grandson as a member. It doesn't make any sense. And she's right. We live in times where uh, you know, the impossible is possible and where magical things are happening. And that's really captured in the book in American MK. And um, for, for our, our, our wonderful viewers in America and those who are watching, how, how are things going? Because you just brought me on to the next question. I was thinking about... Um, uh, the Aliyah, and I know that when you came here, p what people don't realize, Dove, is that uh, it's a big uproot. You have to uproot your bank accounts, houses, uh, furnitures. How? Whether you bring a car, whether you don't bring a car, with it. So there's a huge amount. It's it's a complete uh, up, uprooting, really, to come and to to pay the price to come and live in Israel. How is it for the people in the United States? Are you finding there's a increase or it's difficult there, there's there's a steady number that comes right. i wouldn't say it's the numbers where we would think it should be you know i think what would our ancestors have given to breathe the air of Jerusalem for 10 minutes? And here we are sitting for close to a half hour and peacefully enjoying ourselves in the in Jerusalem hills. Uh, it's a little bit troubling that there aren't more. But like you said, it is very difficult. You know, when God commanded Abraham in the beginning of Genesis to go to his land, he said, leave from your homeland, from your family, from your father, from your home, which really shows the greatness of Abraham doing so. But it really is that feeling. You leave your family, you leave your comforts, uh, it's uh, language, culture, everything you're familiar with. And sports. I, if I, was, I was sports about fan. to say, now I have to watch football games at two o'clock in the morning instead of <laughs> sitting there. It's complicated. Uh, but I think you have to just do a switch in your mind and say, yes, you're going to sacrifice those things because look what you get in return. Uh, you can raise your children in a Jewish state. My children speak Hebrew fluently. It's not, they don't have to have a teacher translate the Bible for them or the prayers for them. They're speaking the language that was spoken here 3,000 years ago by, by our ancestors. It's the most incredible uh, experience. And my children thank us all the time for the fact that we moved here and we took the plunge, so to speak, because it's, it is so difficult. So I'd like to see more numbers of North Americans, in particular English speakers from around the world, coming to Israel. But thank God, there is a steady number, and uh, and hopefully that will increase, though. And and there are organizations. Uh, if you're watching today uh, uh, and you're Jewish and you're thinking, contemplating the big move, and there are organizations like Nefesh Ben Nefesh, and there's other organizations who will help. 
Yes, if you're to... if someone's thinking about uh, just exploring moving to Israel, you go on the Nefesh Benefesh website, and from A to Z, they will walk you through every step. I couldn't have done it. I could not have made it here uh, without their help and their assistance with the bureaucracy and the paperwork and and even the flight. By the way, you fly together. Every single passenger on the plane is moving to Israel. It's the most, wow. uh, I can't even describe it in words what that feels like. We're getting our children settled on this plane, a few hundred people moving to Israel together, and the pilot begins to speak to us as we're getting settled. And he finishes off his routine and he says, everybody sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. I'm here to take you home. Wow. And he said those words and it hit me. Oh my goodness, after 2,000 years of going from country to country and continent to continent, and every single one of them except for America, we were either thrown out or we ran away. Here we were by choice, proudly, taking our place in, in the Holy Land. And uh, I'll never forget that moment. And, and people who are watching can be part of that. You can experience that. And they can go to the, we'll put the uh, details on the screen, how you can contact Nefesh Ben Nefesh. And they've got a website and uh, they're very helpful. Yeah. And indeed, when you, when you arrive here, they're very helpful for banking and all sorts of they, they issues. Everything, and you also you get your identity card right away, and they help you with anything that you need, employment issues, school issues, uh, all the challenges that come with coming to a whole new world, which it really is, uh, they'll help you with that. They have a Go North and Go South program. They're trying to get people settled in the Galilee area, which is rich with biblical history, and the Beersheba uh, area in the South, which is also <laughs> rich with our biblical history. Uh, so there's amazing opportunities uh, in the times in which we live. We really do live in the greatest of times, as you mentioned in your, in your introduction, and uh, people can take part of that and actually make Israel their home. Now, as, a, as well as being a, a guest, and thank you so much for coming on, and if you've just joined us, we've got uh, Rabbi Dov Lipman, a former member of uh, the Israeli Knesset with us, uh, talking to us today about his book, An American Member uh, Behind the Scenes in the 19th Knesset. You've also brought a book into the studio uh, today, uh, Dov, To Unify a Nation, that my vision for the future of Israel. Now, uh, you're also a bit of a firebrand on this I-24. Some of you may have come across it. Uh, some of uh, our friends at home may have seen I-24 or be very familiar with it. But you're doing, you've done a few programs as a political um, correspondent for I-24. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that and about your, your vision to unify the nation and uh, Absolutely. Wh why, why you're getting involved, uh, why is it these big discussions and... Uh, so I'll, like start, I'll start with the end and then work my way backwards. We were not promised this land just for the sake of having a place to live. The whole concept is that we live in the Holy Land as the Jewish people and that serves as a light unto the nations for the whole world and brings spirituality and, 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 and God to the whole world. That's the whole concept behind our having one land to live in. Uh, we, this, this incredible state was declared in May 1948 by David Ben-Gurion and he said those words, a Jewish state. We've been fighting for our lives from that moment until today and we're so focused on security that we really haven't focused enough on what kind of people are we. And I wanna, again, it's an incredible country with incredible things that are going on, but we could be even better and, and show the world there are so many incredible things. Just to give you two examples, we have an organization called Save a Child's Heart where children with, with a heart problems from all around the world can be flown here to Israel and be given the surgeries that they need. They're treated like royalty when they're here. We train doctors from their countries so they can do surgeries back in their place. That's being a light unto the nations. Uh, Innovation Africa, bringing Israel Israeli solar uh, technology to African villages so they can have power to bring water out of the ground and have light bulbs in their homes and give refrigeration for their medicines. That's being a light unto the nations. And most people around the world don't see Israel as that. They see Israel as conflict. They hear about the Palestinian issue, which is an issue which we can't ignore, and we have to try to work it out. But Israel has to stand for so much more uh, than just conflict and security issues. So my vision for the future of Israel relates to that, resolving a lot of the issues that create disunity amongst the Jewish people first and foremost, but also what kind of people are we in terms of zero tolerance for any racism or discrimination and make sure there's equal rights for everyone and there should be a place where everyone can see spirituality. Torah From Jerusalem, Torah, the spirituality should go forth. That's the vision of the prophets and that's what I try to capture in the book To Unify a Nation and that's what I try to do in general. That's why I appear on I-24 to make the case for Israel 
talk about the things that are happening here. Yes, periodically take on some of our Palestinian counterparts who are not uh, taking responsibility for the terrorism and the incitement in their communities to reach out to them and say, we're ready for peace. We don't want to have conflict. I have a son now. I'm blessed to have a son in the Israeli army. I don't want him uh, to have to be fighting in any kind of way. I'd rather have him put his gun away and, and focus on being the cute um, little boy he always was. And um, what, what, what people may not understand and our friends at home that it, what the, the issue is that it's a, a necessity to have an army, which is one of um, uh, compulsory. Is that, is that the yes, right way absolutely. of putting it? That Every 18 when you leave When you leave school. Yep. And in fact, one of the things you've been working very hard to do, and uh, you can do some research after the program and look at all the work that Dove's doing, but one of the things you've worked hard to do is to uh, include a uh, part of the population known as the Haredi, the um, ultra-Orthodox, uh, typically, typically those who wear black hats or you would see them in Meir in that type of area. You've been trying to working very hard for them to be included in the army in the national service because there's been quite a strong uh, fight for that. They've uh, wanted to keep their children or, or, or uh, their families away from that and Correct. they've worked hard. And that's part of the incredible times in which we live, which I talk about in To Unify a Nation. There's no contra a conflict between being as fervently religious as you want to, as scholarly as you want to, and serve in a Jewish army in the Israel Defense Forces. As you said, the entire goal of our army is just to defend ourselves. We would like nothing more than to wake up in the morning and realize we have no more conflict and we could put away all the ammunition and our children can do what children all around the world are doing at 18, 19, and 20, which is going to university and building, uh, building their futures. Uh, but sadly, we live in a world where that's not the case, especially with radical Islam and and Islamic uh, jihadist terrorism. We're, we're fighting that war on the front lines. Uh, you know, it's sadly reached the whole world, but this is the battle we've been fighting in Israel uh, for decades. So we have to fight uh, that war, and it's a war that we join the rest of the world and the rest of the civilized world, and especially the, the broader Christian community. Uh, we, we're fighting that war. Uh, but we can't forget that we need to have unity from within to be successful. And that's why the religious serving in the army is so important. The religious being part of Israeli society uh, is so important. That's been a major focus of mine. That's part of what I lay out uh, in that book in terms of unify a nation. But again, the unity of the nation is not only for the Jewish people living in Israel, but it's also to make sure that Israel continues to be the holy land for all the faiths. We're so proud that we are a nation, the only democracy in the Middle East, where everybody can worship freely as they choose. Christians are being slaughtered slaughtered to our east. It's the, I, I, it's the crime of the last few decades that the world is remaining silent. Uh, Christians can serve here openly, Muslims can serve here openly, Jews obviously, and any other faith as well. We're so proud of that and to make sure that we maintain that spirit of unity and that there at least be one place in the Middle East where people from any background, any culture, and any faith can feel welcome and worship as they choose. And they can, again, they, if they want to, if you'd like to get hold of this book, and it's a, certainly a book you need on your bookshelf, uh, to unify uh, a nation, my vision for the future of Israel. Uh, is the best way to go to Amazon? Or? Definitely the, the easiest way. Uh, you can find it there. It was it printed through a, a company that has their own website as well, but just go on Google and you'll see to unify a nation. And uh, I try to keep the books short and sweet and, and you know meaningful with stories as well so the people who are interested in Israel can understand a little bit more about some of our struggles and our challenges. Israel's a work in progress, the holy land for all nations, but as a startup nation that's just flourishing and you look outside the window and you see the trees growing and the vineyards and these are the biblical prophecies are coming true of an absolute wasteland uh, becoming a, a garden of God and that's what's happening in, in our times that's what we want people to see about Israel thank you so much for joining us today it's been great to have you with thank us you so uh, much Rabbi for Dove. Me. thank you and uh, we um, recommend uh, to our friends at home don't forget to, to get Rabbi Dove's books to unify a nation and an American uh, MK behind the scenes in the 19th Knesset get those quickly and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Shalom, dear friends. Today we are looking at the seven species of the land of Israel. And the name is Shivat Haminim. And so we can read in Deuteronomy 8.8. 8, and this is what he said. A land of wheat and barley and vine and figs and pomegranate and a land of olive oil and honey. So these seven species, Shivat Aminim, were the only species who were brought for offerings at the temple. So you can see there is two grains. 
you have uh, the wheat, which is chita. Again, it's interesting because you have the chet, you know, which is like reminds you life. And obviously wheat, we do a lot of bread with it and is, is what we eat a lot. And after you have uh, barley, which is seora. And after you have five fruits, gefen, which is the, the vine. And we are making uh, the wine with that. And after we have teena, and teena is the fig. And uh, after that, you have the pomegranates, which is the name Rimon. And Rimon is like also with the crown, and is, uh, this fruit comes at the time of uh, Sukkot, which is the last feast, which is speaking about the Malchut, the kingdom. And as, so it's like a royal, um, a royal fruit, and it, it is also on the robe of the high priest. And uh, after you have the land, he said the land of the Zait Shemen, of the olive oil. And obviously, olive oil is very good for you. There is no cholesterol. The olive tree are growing here very nicely. They have the perfect condition to grow. And you see many just even the wild trees. And the last fruit is, uh, is written in Deuteronomy Devash, which is honey. But they discovered that the honey of that at that time wasn't from the honey from the bees, but they were honey from the dates, and dates is tamar. So sometimes when people speak about the seven species, they will speak about the fruit of tamar. And so to know that the devash, the honey, come from tamar. So we look at many names today, and we look at uh, the, the wheat, which is chita. We look at barley, which is seora. We look at uh, Geffen, which is the vine. We look at Teena, which is the fig. We look at Rimon, which is the pomegranate. We look at the land of, uh, of olive oil, which is Echetz Zait Shemen. And we look at the last name, which is Devash for honey. So we look at the seven species today of the land of Israel. And it's a land which is very, very good. And we will see you next week. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dove, and it's, it's been a fantastic program. Um, don't forget, you can email us. We love to receive your emails at info at israelfirst.org. Visit the website, www.israelfirst.org. And remember, we're the program that looks at the people, the land, and the language. <laughs>